Hello, I'm Kerry Ann Mendoza, and many of you are going to know me as the editor at large for the Canary. Um, but what fewer of you will know is that I live with PTSD, post traumatic stress disorder. And <clears throat> and this is Mental Health Awareness Week 2020. Many of us are experiencing Mental Health Awareness Week in incredibly stressful and traumatic circumstances. Many people right now are having their sense of any kind of control over their lives shattered. People are losing friends and families and not being able to be by their bedside when they go or grieve them at a funeral. And it strikes me that these are the kinds of conditions that mean a lot of people living with undiagnosed PTSD will be being triggered right now and having a resurgence of trauma that they may not understand but also there may be people being traumatised right now that are going to need PTSD treatment further down the line. So today I wanted to talk to you about my PTSD journey. You know, what were my traumas? How did they impact me? How did that trauma manifest in my life? And what has recovery looked like? And I've got to be completely honest with you, I'm absolutely shitting myself. I'm sitting here, I've got a sweaty, I've got a sweaty upper lip. I can feel like a shake through my body. Um, I'm very much less articulate than I normally am. And my heart is beating faster than its normal resting heartbeat. And I'm scared for lots of reasons. It's scary to be vulnerable. It's very scary to share the true story of my life when I have been sharing a quite different one for 38 years. That's scary in and of itself. But one of the scariest things about trauma and why it's so hard to recover from is that there are often impacts beyond yourself. A lot of the reason many of us don't talk about our traumas in the first place is because we don't want to traumatise other people. We don't want anyone else to feel the kind of pain we're feeling. We don't want anyone else to feel guilt or, you know, a burden of responsibility for, for things that have happened to us, even for things they did to us. We don't want to hurt people. And what I've realised in coming to the decision to have this conversation with you is that speaking out about our traumas and their impacts is not about hurting other people. It's about healing ourselves. And I know that there are going to be people out there watching this, either who have been diagnosed with PTSD and will feel a sense of validation and recognition, and there will be other people who don't think of themselves as traumatised, have never had a diagnosis of PTSD. And this might just nudge them along the way to getting the support that they don't realise that they deserve. I should give you a trigger warning. We will be talking about some tough issues today and elements of this story will be very emotional and very challenging. But this is not a tragic story. This is actually a story about learning to love yourself, learning to reconcile with your past, learning to process hurt and pain, and in that way, open yourself up to all of the incredible things that are possible when you do that. If you'd have asked me two years ago, I'd have told you that the only trauma in my life was self-inflicted, it was chosen. When I was 21, I chose to go to uh, on a delegation to the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And while I was there, Israel invaded, and I experienced um, what it's like to have you know Apache helicopters dropping missiles on you and tanks barreling down streets and F-16s firing missiles down and you know seeing people die, hearing people die. And within six months of that trip, my entire life had fell apart. I had dropped out of university. My three-year relationship had broken down. My new relationship had broken down. But time passed. 
I felt myself healing. I just sort of left that period of time behind as just like this really horrible confluence of terrible events. Um, that was as a result of coming back from Palestine, having experienced just the worst and not had any um, mental health support, which while true, was also not the full story. But in 2017, my lifelong personal dream came true, and that was to appear on Question Time. And the idea that you can work for a station that employed Katie Hopkins... Right. To, to launch the most... I mean, you know this, you know this. Just, just this week, a Muslim man was beaten to within... within I don't within think Katie Hopkins life, was involved in that And somehow. the people painted over his house Katie Hopkins tweets. So when we're talking about journalistic right. responsibility, right. I think we need to look right. at the mainstream media. I'm going to hear from the woman here. Yeah. Yes, yes. This had been, I guess, a marker for me of having achieved what I'd set out to in life. I grew up in a pretty working class suburb of Bristol. To daydream about question time was, was one thing, but to set it as a mission that it was possible to achieve was pretty audacious, bordering on, you know, the ridiculous. But there I was, in 2017, getting to do it. And I did it, and I did it well. And I woke up the next day, and I could only describe it, it was like someone had turned the engines off. I couldn't even articulate what was wrong. I just felt exhausted, spent, and like whatever had been driving me before this point uh, had switched off. But it didn't last a day. It, it just stayed. I spent the next year doing just about everything I knew to do to pull myself out of this funk. And it just seemed like I was on like a three month maximum cycle. And I go up, uh, then I go down. And that just kept going. And I started to get really scared. I felt like maybe I'd peaked, I was out of ideas. And my headspace just got darker and darker and darker. And I went from being someone who knew that however long I lived, I would be sad when I went. You know, I, I'm one of those people who wants to like skid into my grave sideways, <laughs> being like, what a ride, you know? And oh, can I just have one more go? I went from feeling like that to really bordering on the suicidal. I never planned to kill myself, um, but I think that was only because people would know and then I would be a sad story and I really didn't want to be a sad story. But I really literally kind of prayed, sent thoughts out to the universe, begging for just to, for it to end. Because all of a sudden my life seemed really, really long and I had no idea how I was going to fill all of these hours. And my worst nightmare moved from, you know, either me or the people I love dying too soon to actually me living too long. What if I live to 80? You know, these were the, the thoughts that I was having. I felt bored everywhere. You know, bored and trapped in my marriage, bored and trapped in my work, bored and trapped in my friendships, bored and trapped in my house, but just ev everything was wrong. Nothing made sense. I didn't fit anywhere, I didn't feel safe anywhere, and I just could not account for why I was feeling this way. And I really didn't want to tell anyone either. I really didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want to acknowledge it. And actually, if people did ask me how I was, I'd have a really defensive reaction about it. And I would feel kind of put on the back foot, almost attacked. Like they were trying to suss me out or um, expose me somehow. Which obviously made it almost impossible for people around me to support me at this point. It was really tough for my wife because she 
she could see me pulling away but she didn't know why and you know all I could articulate was that I didn't feel good I'm just so grateful that our marriage had the solid foundation that even in that space I knew that she was the right person and that actually if I couldn't feel my love for her, if I couldn't feel my being in love with her, then there might actually be something more serious at play. And the real final straw came in sort of the back end of 2018. And you may remember this, some of you who have followed the Canary for some time, but I was chosen to give the Claudia Jones Memorial Lecture which is a fairly prestigious honour to have to speak to a room full of journalists about an issue that you choose um, in memory of the radical communist journalist Claudia Jones. What I didn't know was that it was being hosted at the headquarters of The Guardian, who don't like me very much. They decided to boycott me. And because of the nature of The Guardian, it looks pretty bad for a group of, of almost exclusively white people to bar a black woman <laughs> from their building during Black History Month to celebrate a black woman. <laughs> so they had to come up with reasons that put them in the right somehow, which meant a barrage of lies went out. If there were a couple of weeks there where there was almost a bad story about me going out every day. And I was being trolled very heavily. You know, people were saying awful things. And I knew they were untrue. And I knew they knew they were untrue. And I knew why they were saying them. But I also knew that the majority of people would hear their account before they ever heard mine. And why would they not believe them? One of the worst things about it was that the um, chief executive of the National Union of Journalists, so someone who I actually pay fees to on a monthly basis to protect me from abuse and harassment as a journalist, put out a statement validating these lies without ever having had a conversation with me to find out if they were true or not. And that was kind of the final straw for me. I felt something click. Almost, it, was, it was like the emotional version of tearing a muscle. You know, if you're like you're running or you're working out and all of a sudden you either hear a tear or you feel it internally, you have that sensation of some bond snapping. I very much had that sensation internally. Something cracked, broke apart, burst, something happened. And I was writing an article about this because obviously we need to put our story out as an organisation, as the Canary, but also me personally. And I'd, I'd completed, you know, writing this thing. And, and when I stopped, I, I realised that my hands were shaking. And I sort of got up from my desk and I went downstairs and sat in the lounge and just in silence on my own, still shaking, and then just burst into tears. Absolutely burst into tears. I was heaving sobs. And it was really good luck that at that point, my wife actually came in after me. Because my plan was to get the tears done with and then carry on with my day as if nothing had happened. And I had no intention of telling anyone, including my wife, that... I was in this much pain and I told her everything you know that that I knew at that time which was I'm something is broken I'm my head isn't feeling like my head I don't want to be alive I 
I'm terrified all of the time. I feel sick. I feel dead inside. I can't feel anything other than fear at the moment. There's no love. There's no happiness. There's no anything. The whole range of, of human emotion had really reduced to sort of fear or anger. Those were kind of the only things I would feel. And so most of the time I felt nothing. And I don't even know if you can understand what that is, if you've never experienced trauma, to feel nothing. But it's a very common symptom of post-traumatic stress disorder because it's our reaction to um, pain is actually for the brain to shut down, um, for our emotional centres to shut down. And it's kind of like, you know, you're the walking dead, you're physically there, but you're emotionally not. You know, the you that you think of, your personality and everything is not there. And I was burning an enormous amount of energy pretending to be myself because I was too scared to tell anyone. Because honestly, I just had this feeling like I don't want to be the crazy woman. And I didn't want people to judge me or see me as weak. I just had a lot of shame attached to appearing neurotypical, appearing, you know, quote unquote normal. Because I had really finally broken, it was kind of like a, you know, get busy living or get busy dying moment for me. That really was what got me to the doctor and to get a diagnosis of, of PTSD. So I got my diagnosis and I promised myself that I would do the Claudia James Memorial Lecture, but that was all I could do. I had my speech, I could turn up, I could deliver it, I could pretend one more time, but then, done. I was going to take a month off, I was going to go into PTSD therapy. A fellow canary who has also dealt with PTSD, I think it might have been even as we were saying goodbye that night and I was sort of like, see you in four weeks kind of thing, has said to me, look, this, might, this may take you a lot longer than four weeks to deal with. And I just want you to know if that's okay. And I am so grateful for that conversation because it's now been 18 months and I realise that being in recovery from traumas like this is not a linear process. And it takes as long as it takes. And its I don't think it's something that's really ever even completed. Because that's almost the wrong mindset. Because that makes it sound like a job that needs to be done. And that's not what it is. It's a journey that you go on. And it's a commitment to yourself that you will no longer be a hostage to these traumas. That you deserve you are worthy of being out of that pain and that you can bear the pain. It won't destroy you. And that beyond that pain, something else exists. And at that point, it was, I thought I was living with undiagnosed PTSD since going to Palestine, living through this hell and not having dealt with that trauma, not having processed it. And that's what I went in with. But what became clear literally in the very first session that I had with my trauma specialist was that I was traumatised long before I ever set foot in Palestine. And what I'm going to do is go through these traumas in the order that I discovered them. Because this experience of PTSD recovery for me has been like following a trail of breadcrumbs I left for myself. Stretching from today back literally to my infancy. And I'm really grateful actually to myself for laying those breadcrumbs. I really created records 
in the moment that meant when I was ready to face this trauma, I would have the receipts. And I find that element of PTSD particularly fascinating because even though my conscious self was completely oblivious to the trauma that I was living through, my subconscious was laying the breadcrumbs. Almost in the knowledge that future me was going to come back and deal with all this and she was going to need some help. And the idea of working in concert with yourself um, is like, it's a pretty cool feeling. Like we're a team, all of these different versions of, of myself are actually a team working to resolve these mysteries. My recovery process started with a, a therapy session face to face where we sat down and we built something called a trauma timeline. And I was asked to put, to basically start at naught and come right up to the present day and log things that occur to me as traumatic events along that timeline. So you put down your age, what happened, and if you feel like it was a big trauma, you put a capital T, and if you felt like it was a more minor trauma, you put a little T. I had a trauma at seven. When I was seven, a male cousin of mine who was five years older than me began sexually abusing me. And that went on for five years until I was 12 when he raped me. And and I had never acknowledged that for what it was. I had almost filed it away as almost like a secret, a clandestine relationship that ended badly. I saw myself as an equal partner in it. I was ashamed of it. And he became my favorite cousin. I loved him deeply. And so I brought up this clandestine relationship in, a, in this trauma timeline and said, literally put it down with a little t, it was a small t, and I do, I'm not even sure why I'm doing it, it's just I've had some, you know, it keeps coming up, it stays on my mind. And the real kicker was I had, I have this memory of being seven and being in the bathroom running a bath and thinking about what had been happening with, with this cousin. And I remember thinking, when this is happening to other little girls on the telly, they're like all upset and everything. They're like crying and, and I'm not. So that's not what's happening to me. And the thing is, as I've got older, um, one of the ways I respond to, you know, a situation which overwhelms me is I go, it's, a, it's fine. It's, everything's just going to be okay. You know, even though I have no idea how, it, how it's going to be, it's just like dismissed. No, we're not going to think about that anymore. It's, it's done. It's going to be fine. So I know what my bullshit voice sounds like now. Basically, I know I know what that voice sounds like, that overwhelmed voice who's just sort of trying to make everything okay. And when I listen to that seven-year-old now, that's the voice. That was like the first breadcrumb I discovered that I'd left for myself of knowing, you know, retaining that memory in the first place, of being able to replay it now and see it in a whole different perspective. And that part of me able to drag myself into that therapy session and bring this up, knowing it was going to call time on this, but doing it anyway. Even though I was qualifying away like crazy to this therapist, like, you know, this qualification and, you know, there's this caveat and that caveat and just so many excuses for him and why he was the way he was. He, I, I later found out he was an abuse survivor and so I just went, well, victim of circumstance, what are you gonna do? But what my therapist was able to do was give me a perspective on those events that I'd never been able to have. And it's very difficult to create 
this new perspective for yourself when you're a traumatized person because you ha really have no idea how much you hate yourself. It was not visible to me. I thought I had high self-esteem, if anything, bordering on the arrogant. I believed that actually it was good to have people around me who, as I refer to it, chipped away at my edges because otherwise I'd just dominate and ruin everything. Quite what I thought I was capable of, I have no idea, but this, you know, there, that was there. And so essentially you don't know what you don't know and you, you need to have a process in place and someone trained and competent in managing you through this recovery process because it's terrifying and it's and it's the bravest decision you ever, you'll ever make for yourself. So that's where we started. We started with that trauma of unpicking what happened and that meant looking back at you know events and I realized that you know I had left so many breadcrumbs around this. I had that memory in my mind. I had told um my friends that um this had happened i didn't tell them what had happened in the way it had i told them that i'd lost my virginity at 12 to a cousin i even told some people who that cousin was like signposts I, i'd written it in my diary so there were, there was all of this evidence that this was a thing that happened and i'm i'm grateful to myself that i did that because i could ground these memories Processing that trauma was the most pain I've ever experienced. When I started to understand what had happened, it was like finding out you had been conned. And I realized that I had been groomed, that somebody that I loved had weaponized that love to use me for their own ends. I felt anger. I felt, anger doesn't even touch it. I felt a rage that burned. And there was a period of time which maybe lasted about a month or two where I was burning rage from the moment I opened my eyes in the morning till I closed them at night. Like, I couldn't believe it is, was even possible to be at that level of rage for that long. You know, think about rage. Often it lasts, a, it's a flicker and it's done. This spike of rage and then something else. But this was like, really like a fire was in my chest and it was burning and burning and it only seemed to be getting brighter and I felt like I couldn't even contain the amount of anger and that was what I would have felt as a 7 to 12 year old if I had felt safe enough to feel it. You know, if I would have had, the, if the support systems had been in place at that point in my life to address it at the time, those were the feelings that I had buried with this story. And they were all coming up. And one of the problems with looking back at past events is that you bring yourself into them. So when I look at that, at what happened to me now, I look at it almost putting all of the emotional intelligence and resources and capabilities I have now into that child. But that child didn't have all of this. And I think that's part of the reason why we judge ourselves so much. The other issue is part of what, what I did and what many child abuse um, survivors have done is we accept the shame. Because we don't put the shame where it belongs, on the abuser, we end up internalising it. We take on the blame, the responsibility, the culpability, all is in us. Because that's the only way we're not a victim. We, we, we were a party to this thing. And it took 
some considerable time and work for me to accept that that wasn't the case. And when I did, I got really angry and really upset. I don't remember ever having cried like that. I was crying for me, I was crying for me at that age, I was crying for what would have been possible if this hadn't happened. I was furious because he had been through abuse, so he actually knew. It wasn't like I said, well, he didn't have any idea what the impact on me would be. He did have a, have a very good idea of what the impact would have been on me. You know, passing on that pain is something that I could not even imagine doing. Even to my worst enemy, I wouldn't want them to feel or experience what I went through. And the idea that you could go through that and then do it to someone else, that filled me with anger. And I just burned. And that was okay. I was allowed to burn. I had a partner, you know, my wife throughout all of this was exceptional, you know, understanding that I had a right to burn. I had a right to be angry. No one was telling me I needed to get over it and move on. They really, I was fortunate enough to have people around me who understood that, you know, something happened to me when I was very young and I had absorbed, I had taken it into myself. You know, instead of exploding, I'd imploded. And I'd been walking around with this wound all this time and I didn't know it and no one else knew it. So now it was absolutely, it was too, you know, it's not too late. You can hurt about this now, even though it's so far after the fact. In fact, you need to hurt about this now because you can't move forward. One of the concepts that you work on, on recovery for this, is shame. It, it often surprises people the intimacy that it can exist between an abused person and the person who is abusing them. And this is kind of a self-protection mechanism for both parties. The abuser needs to believe that they love and care for the person they're abusing because how else are they going to sleep at night unless they're literally a sociopath they really have this concept that what they're doing to you they're doing with you because they love you and as a as a victim in that exchange that is a comfort a much more comforting belief in the moment then somebody that I love and care about and trust is just violated me and is physically and mentally abusing me. And so these needs kind of work off each other and create a weird intimacy. And if you'd have seen us at family parties and other things, you would assume we were the very best of friends. I would seek him out. And so eventually when I had cried and raged there was really one task left for me, and that was to put the shame where it belonged. And I realised that for me, the only way I was going to do that was I needed to tell him. I needed to physically sit in front of him, look him in the eye, and tell him, I know what you did to me. I know now. I have figured it out. And what you did was disgusting. And you hurt me more deeply than any person on earth. And I needed him to know that I knew that he sexually abused me and he raped me. And so I met him under the guise of just catching up for a beer in our local pub. I wanted it to be in a public place. I had my family, members of my family and my wife literally outside the pub and their job was to enter the pub 30 minutes after I had entered myself and to sit at another table because what that would tell me is that we were at half an hour and it was time to wind it down because I didn't want a long conversation with him this was not a healing conversation this is not a conversation where I'm like 
oh, you know, in the future we'll be friends and I forgive you. That was not the conversation. The conversation I wanted to have with him was essentially to pass the shame box over. Because there may be a day where I choose to forgive him. There may be a day where that happens. But it's really important, particularly in cases of child sexual abuse, that we permit ourselves to hold that person responsible because otherwise we can't pass the shame box over. We're left carrying it. And if we're busy carrying that shame box, it's very difficult for us to have spare kind of capacity to take on love and tenderness and joy and all of those other wonderful things because we're too we're occupied with this box. And so that's what I did. And two things happened. One was that he began with a flat out denial, but very quickly actually moved to start trying to mess with timelines and imply my culpability and all of these things. And I realised while he was talking, I had an almost out of body experience where I realised that all of these conversations that I've been having with myself about why I was responsible for this having happened to me were not my original thoughts. He had been telling me these things and I had simply forgotten. Because the moment he started saying them, I knew I'd heard them before. And that was simultaneously, it set the fire burning again, it made me very, very angry but it also completed something for me. I realised, I really got in my bones that I was groomed, that I was a victim of grooming. And what is so insidious about grooming is that you don't even realise you have been victimised. Part of you does, there's this incongruent, weird feeling of like, you have this feeling something is very, very wrong, but, you don't trust yourself because you have been manipulated into believing that there is no possible way that this person would do that to you. And the second moment of that conversation that was most important is I actually said to him that you know, I had given him a pass on this because of what happened to him. Because I felt so bad for him having lived through that. I didn't want to hurt him more by outing him as something. That would mean he just suffered again. Because I I had made the person who abused him responsible for him abusing me. Rather than it being his his choice to do that and I said that to you know I've given you a pass for so long but you never deserved it because you did this to me and I haven't gone and done it to anyone else and if I had I certainly wouldn't consider it an excuse that it had happened to me I wouldn't expect anyone to excuse me for behaving like that because this had happened to me So you, and I can't believe that you did this to me. You watched me before this happened to me. You saw this seven year old running around just having a normal life and you chose me. You chose to to give your pain to me. And I described the process um, to realize I'd been groomed, to realize I'd been manipulated. And as I was speaking, I saw a flash of recognition across his eyes. And despite the fact that his words to me were, I didn't rape you, I didn't sexually abuse you, and then paradoxically you initiated it, and the times were, you know, there was a moment where we locked eyes and I knew he knew. Just for that split second, he realised he had raped me and he had abused me. 
and it didn't matter what he said after that and it never will I know that he knows what he did even if only for that moment before his self defence mechanisms came back again and in the moment I felt exhilarated as I walked away from that table I felt free in a way I had never felt and I felt like I had delivered justice albeit late for that seven-year-old, eight-year-old, nine-year-old, 10-year-old, 11 and 12-year-old versions of myself. They all got justice that day. I actually am, I remember how nervous I was sitting there and part of the way I galvanized myself was I'd spent all week kind of looking at a picture of myself at seven just to remember how young I was, that this happened, this was who this happened to, it didn't happen to me. And I kind of occasionally would look over his shoulder and visualise my seven-year-old self there watching this and wishing so hard that I could go back through time and protect her. And I can. And that allowed me to open the next bag of pain which was that it was that I can't ever do that you know I think there was a part of me that hoped having that confrontation would make everything go away and the next stage of recovery was really about acceptance that it would never go away that I couldn't change the story of the past that had been written but actually that seven-year-old did get justice because I actually am her You know, the same body that was abused was sitting there in front of him. The same eyes, the same lips, the same hands. And suddenly I started to realise that while the physical abuse of that was horrific, the far more damaging in the longer term was what happened to me mentally in keeping that secret in not having any help, in what I came to believe about myself, the amount of shame that I was carrying and not expressing, the mask that I was wearing to the rest of the world, the pretense I was maintaining that I was living this happy, wonderful, safe childhood. It really hurt me. And people often ask why you know, why did you not say anything? Why did you, and gee, goodness gracious, believe no one asks that question more than a, an abuse survivor. Nobody. You know, why didn't I speak out? Why didn't I, th- you know. But I didn't say anything for reasons I've only been able to understand further into my process. I knew at this point that The reason I didn't say anything was that we had this really amazing family, like 20 odd cousins, lots of aunties and uncles, we saw each other all the time, we all went on holidays together, it was this whole community and I I had a secret that was like a time bomb and I was, I felt very much like if, if, if this thing goes off, it's going to destroy everything for everybody. And I can't do that. I can't be responsible for for killing our family. So I just swallowed it. The sort of sum total of that decision meant that I was kind of primed to be abused again. Being abused that young, having your trust weaponized against you that young, being groomed that young makes you vulnerable to it later in life because frankly you think that's what you deserve i thought that's what i deserved i thought that's what love is and people who love you can like they they really can't do anything wrong pretty much or like anything that they do to you as long as they do it with good intentions 
you cannot hold it against them. That's sort of the schema, the, the mindset that I came out of this with, without kind of fully articulating it or realising it. And I found myself in a series of relationships with with partners who who were sort of varying shades of, of abusive and ranging just from, you know, people who just didn't get me, who didn't, you know, but through to, I, you know, spent several years in a romantic relationship with a narcissist, which then became a friendship that stretched on another 10 years beyond that. You know, and this person really was committed to messing with me and keeping me small and all while appearing externally to be my biggest fan and my biggest supporter. So they would do things for me that no one else in the world would do. Like extraordinary things, really extraordinary things. But none of them were free because every single one of them was weaponized in some way to make me incapable and childish and small. And they became the critical voice in my mind telling me that, you know, they were really lucky. I was really lucky they were around, you know? Because if not, I'd probably be dead by now. You know, how incapable I am, that's pro. you know. It, you know, and, it, it, and that drip, drip, drip process that a narcissist has with you where they enter your life as often when you're in a really vulnerable position and she entered my life at that point where I came back from university to Bristol and was in bits this is the point she enters my life so at my lowest ebb and she worked meticulously to get me out of that state to you know, help me get a new job, to transform my life, you know, all of these things. Everywhere I looked, she was responsible for this growth that I was having. And that's the point. She was responsible. I wasn't. It would never have happened without her. That was the, that was the narrative. To the point where she actually ended up with complete control over me. You know, what I would wear what I would speak about and not speak about. I was terrified of her disapproval. That was the worst thing. And so I would do absolutely anything. And so I find out, so that that's the next revelation that I have in therapy is that this woman I've been calling my best friend for well over a decade is another abusive person in my life. And what was all the more shocking was when I started to speak to people closest to me about it, they already knew. But they also knew that there was no way I could be told that. I needed to get there myself. And they were right. And I'm glad I was able to do it for myself. So that was the next kind of staking of my boundaries was actually you know, meeting face to face with her and saying, I've figured it out. I know what you did. It wasn't okay. And I no longer wish to have you in my life. And it was as simple as that. And she's gone. No drama, no screaming shouts, just, I see you. And you will never do this to me again because I won't let you. So that was the, the second trauma that we discovered and starting to realise that I didn't have PTSD, I had complex PTSD. I was actually a person who'd lived through several traumas and as a result of that, there was a lot of behaviour, a lot of, you know, my whole sense of self had been formed inside of trauma. And I just started to realise how much I hated myself. And what happened immediately having confronted both of those traumas is I started to view myself very differently and I actually remember feeling self-esteem for the first time and I was 37 
it's very difficult to know that you don't know what something is if you've never felt it because of the language we have for things. So if I, you know, to me, self-esteem was feeling good about yourself. It was only external validation and facts. So, you know, people saying nice things to me was self-esteem. And if I was feeling bad about myself, I needed to be able to look down and go, well, I did this, 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 and this thing. A bad person wouldn't do that. But then I'd second guess that and go, well, if I'm only doing these things so that I feel good about myself, maybe I am a monster. I believed for a long time, for a while, I was a narcissist. I, just the level of hatred was immense and I didn't see it. And the reason I didn't see it was because I thought it was true. And that's the catch. I think I'd always figured negative self-talk is when you're saying bad things about yourself that aren't true. But because these things were true to me, they didn't occur as self-hatred or negative self-talk. They were simply rational observations that any decent human being would make. And now, being able to give those shame back, give the shame back to the abusive partner, give the shame back to the abusive relative. And also by experiencing that pain, by being willing to feel an amount of pain, which I genuinely believe would kill me because it was so big. Doing that, feeling that, having those experiences gave me an entirely new view of, of myself. And I started to feel this thing, which I now know is self-esteem. Actually being proud of myself. And it was incredible. And that gave me a strength and I, and kind of gave me the courage to dig deeper. Every step of this was about confronting what I was able to confront when I was able to confront it and being patient, so patient with the resulting pain, the being stopped. You know, I would spend weeks just in bed and that's okay because this was the time that I was ready to grieve all of this and it's a lot to grieve. And one of the things that really helped me through this process, one was the extraordinary, my extraordinary therapist. The next was my extraordinary wife and friends who just stepped up. I have the most extraordinary brothers who heard this, didn't make it about themselves and their own anger, but listened and centered it on my pain. I couldn't have asked for more. And one of the things I think to bear in mind when you go on your own PTSD journey is that it is not linear. You don't have a starting point where you kind of go on this smooth trajectory up. You know, if I had a chart, like there would be a trend up, but it would be like this. And sometimes you flatline for months and then something happens and it releases something. It's a really incredible journey. I never imagined that there was even something beyond the pain. And what was incredible about this, these particular elements of the journey was it was when I started to realize that it wasn't gonna be all pain. That there would be stages which were about pain and there would be stages that were about who I'm going to be now I can put that pain where it belongs. And that I don't have to be this person 
triggered, scared, you know, inauthentic, lying to myself and everyone else for the rest of my life. I'm not trapped in that. In fact, I can be exactly as I am and people will love me. And more, I will love myself. I don't think I would have thought, I, that wasn't possible. And that's what keeps people quiet. That's what stops people addressing their trauma. The fundamental issue is we don't think we're worthy of love. We don't think people will love us or accept us in the whole. We have to present ourselves as something other than we are to stand a chance in this world. And that's lonely. And I was very, very lonely. And my most recent trigger, and I think probably the one that has taken my recovery in a direction which I never, like, wouldn't have imagined even a couple of months ago, began with a trigger at Christmas. And it helped me realise that actually I, I was traumatised before I was ever sexually abused and raped. Like the conditions existed for me to be groomed before then. And two things happened sort of as bookends. The process started um, at Christmas where one of my brothers out of nowhere, because he was just happened to be affected by something that day, recalled watching me being physically assaulted basically really badly beaten by my mum and this he was remembering this because it was actually traumatic for him because he was thinking to himself you know this was taking place on the landing in our house and it was beginning to look like my mum was gonna kill me potentially um and he was, you know, my brother at that point was two years younger than me. And we were, very, you know, we were young. We were maybe 12 and 10. And, you know, and him saying, and him actually thinking to himself, oh my God, I'm going to have to push my own mum down the stairs. Because otherwise she might kill my sister. And this set something else off in me, which was, that was true, that happened. And that wasn't the only time that happened. You know, my mum was living with borderline personality disorder long before she was only recently diagnosed in the last couple of years. And so she was in a situation where she had an undiagnosed, untreated mental health condition that was affecting her. And I have enormous empathy for that because I've lived a, a whole chunk of my life like that and I know how confusing and horrible it is to have your intentions unable to become reality because you just you know psychologically you're not there and I was really clear when I was growing up that my mum's frustrations with you know her marriage her kind of lot in life and what I now know, you know, her mental health condition, I sort of became a lightning rod, like a focus for her resentment and her anger. And I think in part because I look a lot like her. So, and I don't think it's any surprise that she became more angry and more violent as I got older, you know, as I grew more defiant, as I insisted on boundaries and tried to enforce them you know wanting to wear the clothes that I wanted to wear rather than what she would dress me in she was angry she seemed to be angry at me all of the time just just all of the time and I grew to hate her I actually grew to hate her I lost all respect for her she was like a tyrant to me she was just this person who I could feel the mood change that she would begin spoiling for a fight. She was full, she was burning. You know, she had that rage. And she was looking for something to express it. 
and I would try and hide and you know f go out be out or be somewhere else in the ha you know just not cross her path because I knew she would seek me out and it was terrifying I didn't feel safe in my own home I actually did have this feeling like it was possible that she could kill me not that she would set out to but that she was so out of control of her senses that it was possible that she would go too far. So while dealing with the fact that I was being sexually abused and raped, I was also dealing with the fact that I wasn't safe at home either because I could be hurt there too. I was really, really close to my dad. And in so many ways, he was my emotional anchor. He, we were incredibly close and he really was the parent I, I relied on for emotional support. I didn't have any, I don't even now have a memory of my mum ever soothing me, you know, telling me it was going to be okay, holding, you know, cuddling me, stroking my hair and saying, it's okay, it's going to be okay. I, I literally can't remember that. That's not to say it didn't happen ever. But it happened infrequently enough or at a young enough point that I have absolutely no, no memory of it. That, but I have loads of memories of my dad doing it. So he picked up that, that responsibility really to do that. And I relied on him for that. And I am eternally grateful to him for, for being that. But he wouldn't protect me from her. And I remember growing, as I started to grow up, I began to be angry at him. But I couldn't be angry at him because I was so dependent on him. So I sort of suppressed the anger. And I remember, as I think, my dad had always made it very clear that his, ha he, the, I mean, he will say, I'm happy if you're happy. Which on the one hand sounds quite cute. But on the other hand is also saying, don't tell me if you're unhappy because it will hurt me. And that very much fed into my willingness to perform the role of a happy, safe, you know, untroubled child to protect him from the reality that he would then have to deal with. I would shatter his world. And so that was another way in which I was kind of primed to not be able to deal with, to not be able to ask for help when I needed it. Because one parent was, you know, a danger in themselves. And the other parent, who I loved so much, I couldn't bear to hurt because he told me explicitly that it would kill him. So you can't move inside of that as a kid. You can't think, think your way out of it. The most important thing to my dad was the idea that our home was a sanctuary. He'd had a really tough childhood and he was wedded to the idea that he was not, he was going to create a home, in his words, that was the sanctuary. So me saying that that wasn't true was like killing his dream. You know, he's only got this one dream just to create this sanctuary. He's not got ambitions about where he's not trying to be a, you know, anything out there in the world. He's not, you know, trying to get rich. He's not doing anything. His sole mission in life is to create the sanctuary. Are you going to take that away from him? What kind of a selfish bastard would do that? That was the, the conversation I was having. But more than that, what I... I think what I'd started to understand was that his preference to, I guess, re almost live in denial, live in a pretend world where we're all happy, I think became more, became more important to him than actually being happy and actually taking the steps necessary to be happy. And that impacted me. You know, when my mum would kind of turn her guns on him, I would defend him because I believe we were allies. 
we were close and if someone hurt my dad oh you're gonna get it but he did not reciprocate he didn't stand in even when I told him later even when we had this conversation at Christmas where my brother is telling him to his face what's happened and he's looking upset about it there was no resolution to defend me to make that right and I realized that I'd always known that but he'd always told me that he would do anything for me and that the most important thing to him was that I was happy and safe. And what I'd started to realize was actually the thing that was most important to him was that he felt happy and safe. He felt that we were happy and safe and he wasn't forced to take the kinds of decisions he would have had to take and have in order to make that sanctuary real. This actually culminated in a, I had ended up having an emotional flashback to actually literally being a baby. I've never had an emotional flashback in any of this, not for the rape, not for the child, you know, not for the sexual abuse, not for the narcissism. It's not something I've had ever experienced so acutely. But I think the reason my brain kind of did this was that what happened happened before I had words. So my normal access into each of these breakthroughs has been to write letters from myself at that age to myself now and then back to myself as myself now to myself then. And that allows you to see that these are different people essentially. These are you know, this person is 10 and this person is 38. They have very different ways of thinking. They have a whole different language level and that would come out in the writings. And that was a really great way to sort of reconcile these different parts of myself that have remained fragmented. It's part of the process that you go through. And I could not write a letter that fully expressed this period, this ch this this situation with my parents and then I had this massive emotional flashback where I was conscious that I was lying on my back too high I was high I was scared because I was high up and I was terrified and my mum was there but she wasn't actually taking care of me and I needed to shut up and I really wanted to scream but I knew I had to shut up and this happened to me while I was in the bath and my wife just sat in the room with me while it happened just saying it's okay just let it be you're gonna survive it you'll get through it and I felt I, I've, I, I don't know if you've ever had feelings so big that you thought they would just shatter you. But that's how this felt. Like I couldn't contain it. And when I came out of it, all I could do was sob because it was so sad that there was this baby who was terrified but already knew that it wasn't okay to say she was hurting, to show that she was hurting. I needed to shut the fuck up. And I was fortunate enough to then take that into, I took that into my next therapy session and said, look, this is what's happened. I think I'm beginning now to get in touch with the earliest traumas. I think this is what's happening. I'm getting right to the root. And so she actually put, took me through an exercise where she took me back there. But because it's now controlled, she, we're actually now able to look around to interrogate that memory a little more closely and understand actually what was happening. Because my experience of the emotional flashback was mostly just the pain, like emotional pain, not a, not a physical pain, overwhelming emotional pain. And I was able to, to realise, oh, I'm afraid because I'm high up. I'm in space. Like imagine being a baby. And 
you know, you're on, I figured I was either, I think I might have been on a changing station or potentially we thought maybe having a bath, you know, being washed in the sink, having a bath, something like that, where I, I had a, I was elevated. And, you know, one, I wasn't being taken care of. But worse than that, I wasn't being allowed to express the pain and the feeling of like choking that pain down and then going numb. And I realised, oh my God, I've been doing this since I was probably six months old. It started there and then it worked, it's fanned its way out. And what's been really amazing about this particular completing this trauma is that in the same way that when this process began it began with that fracture that sense of something coming apart of breaking in a bad way this process of going through this early trauma and acknowledging that the conditions were created almost immediately that I went out into the world for me to respond to trauma this way, to respond to my own pain this way, that I wasn't taught to self-soothe in a, in a healthy way, suddenly I felt something break in a positive way, as if some shackles that had been holding me in place had been cut. Because suddenly, so much made sense. So many of these little ticks in my character that I've considered character flaws just made sense. I understand how I why I would react that way to those things now. You know, I understand why I don't feel safe to talk about my pain. And I understand why one of the worst things that I experience is feeling like I've been tricked. It's all ways of, you know, combating this. And even in the case of this, my relationship with my parents, I realised I'd left breadcrumbs for myself. I'd actually written a whole book when I was 17 and I noticed that all of the dads in it were awful. And because I was the kind of 17 year old that actually did sit around daydreaming that I was gonna be, you know, interviewed about my best-selling book for a literary supplement, I actually imagined being interviewed and someone saying, you know, we've noticed that, you know, a running theme through this narrative is the failure of fathers to protect their children. You know, can you speak to that? You know, me being, oh, you know, I think I was able to write about it because, you know, I'm fortunate enough to have a father that does those things. You know, I have a really great relationship with my father, which gave me the safety to imagine, imagine what that, imagine how horrible it would be not to have that. And so I wanted to write that. And it was just like complete nonsense. And I guess even then it was like, I was speak, it was trying to speak to myself. I was trying to find ways of expressing these frustrations that I was having. And there's a scene in the book that st sticks with me to now where basically a father is with his son. So he didn't have a daughter, he had a son. And there is an incoming war. The dad's become really patriotic and wants to fight in this war. And the kid knows that the war is bogus. And his dad is participating in something rubbish. But the dad is all really proud and he's having this conversation with his son about how important it is to him as a father that he's going to defend him and he's going to do the right thing. And this kid is like on the surface saying yes, yes, yes. And under it he's saying you have no idea. Like you are living in a, in a delusion and I will not join you there. You are not keeping me safe. You're hurting me by going along with this charade. And I look back now and I think, oh my God, that, that was the charade that, you know, that this was a very accurate description of what was happening to me at the time, but which I could not be present to because I needed him so badly. Like I, I couldn't be angry at him because I needed him so much. 
I think that was actually the bit, one of the biggest barriers. And I think anyone with trauma, you will face this. As I said at the beginning, my parents love me. And my parents did their best. They are not bad people. They are really good people. But they are people who are imperfect and they have their own stuff going on and their stuff impacted me. And what I'd felt all of this time was that I couldn't say anything. I couldn't even acknowledge to myself the negative impacts they had on me because that would just be so extraordinarily ungrateful with everything they've done for me. You know, they attended my every football match, my every play, my, you know, they've, they are my biggest cheerleaders. And they failed me in these specific ways. Those things are both true. And one does not wipe out the other in the same way that them doing these things doesn't wipe out the, all of the good things they did. The good things they did don't wipe out the bad things either. And to be at the point where you can have that reality and say it's okay to see things as they are means I don't have to pretend anymore. And if I don't have to pretend there, I don't have to pretend anywhere. And I think really that's why, even though it was chronologically the first traumas that I had happened there, I don't think I could get to them until I'd done the other work, until I felt safe enough in the world, until I felt like I could survive, until I realized that I deserve to be happy and boundaries are essential. and that I'm allowed to be happy. And that my happiness is my own. I don't owe it to anybody. And perhaps I think the biggest message I would like to give to people is I went into this and for a while I really felt like I was only alive when I was happy. And so looking into these corners dredging up this stuff from the past was only gonna hurt. Like it was only gonna cause pain and disruption. What is the point? And I'm now starting to realize what the point is. It's because there is a life beyond it. But even more than that, I now have my, I literally have my life back. And I'm still very much in recovery. There are good days, there are bad days, there are middle days. But on all of those days, I am more alive than I have been up until this point. Because I'm in my life. I'm not hovering above it. I'm not inventing it like a fairy tale to people. I feel real in a way I have never felt real. I can look at my past now and all of the doors that were closed are open. I can see in all of the rooms. And yeah, do you know what? In some of those rooms, there is some really ugly shit going on. But they're my rooms. This was all my life. And I want my whole life. I don't only exist when I'm happy. I'm not only worthy of love when I'm happy. I'm not only a good daughter when I'm happy. And it has allowed me to have a much deeper love for basically everything. I feel very much like without realising it, if you imagined kind of an emotional range, like a spectrum, like a rainbow, I had like four colours, you know, like black, grey, maybe a little bit of yellow and a green. And I was having to pretend everything else. 
and as at each stage of this recovery at each point where you've had a trigger i then you you get basically the process you go through is you have a trigger you then investigate the causes of the trigger you identify the original trauma that's associated to that trigger and you begin to process it you begin to separate your stories about it from what actually happened you put responsibility and shame right where it belongs. You un- you begin to understand how your reaction to that trauma is all over your life. And then it doesn't have to be all over your life anymore. And when you have one of those reactions, instead of feeling a need to go and do something or fight someone or move house or end a relationship or whatever other reaction you have fight flight whatever comes up instead you can start to self-soothe you can say i understand exactly why i am having this reaction even though it makes no superficial sense because i'm taken back to that point but you know what it's okay that I feel this way because a really bad thing happened and it's not happening now. So it's okay. Cry, take a day off, go for a walk, rage, whatever you need to do. It's okay. You're just hurting. And so I'd say to anyone who recognises themselves in this, you will be dropping your own breadcrumbs. There is a very real chance you're listening to this now because a part of you may want to heal too. And I would encourage you to go on that journey when you're ready. But no one will be able to drag you to it. Everyone is in their own, it, everyone is on their own timeline. I'm grateful that it happened when it happened. I can't imagine now I wouldn't exchange the life I have now for the life I had then for literally all of the money in the world. I'm experiencing emotions and feelings and thoughts that I've never had. And life has become exciting again. Life has become unpredictable again. I have become creative and I'm at peace with myself. And sometimes I'm not but now I have a place to go when those moments come. And I'm proud of myself for doing it. This this is the bravest thing I ever did. It's the hardest thing I ever did and it's the best gift I ever gave myself. And I just want it for everyone. So wherever you are in your journey, know that you are not alone and know that you deserve recovery mental health awareness week 2020 thank you so much for listening to me i hope in some way this has helped you i'll post links with this video um, to guide people towards the support and therapies that you can begin to look at if that's something that's necessary for you but it may also be that you're watching this video because someone you love is going through this journey and know that you make a difference to them every day just by being there there is nothing for you to do except accept them thank you for listening and take care of yourselves bye for now